My name is Tess Redgrave. I've worked at the university in a variety of roles for about 12 years. Uh, in 2013 I did the Masters of Creative Writing and from that I already had a piece of writing but from that has come this novel Gone to Pegasus which has just been published. Go back to 1998. I'd had, I had two young kids, I was living in Auckland and I wanted an adventure and I went off down to Stewart Island and joined a sea kayaking group down to the bottom of right hand corner of Stewart Island to Port Pegasus. Port Pegasus is the most remote harbour in New Zealand, I think. There's no civilization there whatsoever. It's wild, it's got mountains called Gog and Magog and Bald Cone. They've all lost their tops because of the roaring 40s winds that blast in there. We camped and kayaked and we heard Kiwis at night and we explored an old tin mining operation. And I spent a lot of that trip dreaming and I started dreaming up a novel a story that I wanted to write and somehow I lit a pilot light that has never gone out from there. One of the other original aspects of this novel is I had a great grandfather that came out to New Zealand from Scotland in 1877 and he had died by 1892, left a wife and five children and had always been covered up in my family as what had happened to him. In fact he I found out that he had died in Ashburn Hall as a 32 year old and I was I was intrigued to understand what had happened there and why it had been so buried. And I started writing about him in Dunedin and I put him in Seacliff, Lunatic Asylum. And then I realised I couldn't have a novel just about a madman, what, it was going to be so depressing. So I started looking at his wife and his wife had been very involved with the temperance movement. After he died she became a, was apparently a God-fearing Bible holder for the rest of her life and she lived into her 90s. So then I had her and him in the novel as characters. And, but I realised this still, you've, you've got to get drama and interest. And I realised I still needed more and I needed a foil for her. She was going to be the straight up temperance woman. So I had this woman, Grace, come from India to New Zealand who already knew a lot about suffrage and was a fierce supporter of suffrage. And I put those two together and it was fireworks. It's 1892 in Dunedin and that's the year before women won the vote in New Zealand and there's gathering momentum to separate the temperance movement which was getting men to stop drinking basically and the franchise movement which was purely petitioning government to give women the vote and there was a big meeting in Dunedin which is in my novel which is about the separation of temperance and franchise and the franchise union is formed in Dunedin. Well, my early background was journalism and I'd learnt, I'd written a lot of features and I'd learnt how to research. And I knew, I knew Papers Past really well, which is a huge res historical resource in New Zealand. I spent hours, I had screeds, suitcases full of research on tin mining and on the suffragettes and Dunedin's history. And I had the start of a novel, but it was chunked full of research and it was just cluggy. And I applied to the creative writing course and was very fortunate that Michelle Leggett, who's also interested in 19th century women, picked it up and she was one of the mentors on the course that I was going to be on in 2013 said, I want to do this. Michelle was very intuitive to work for and she just sort of helped me shake all the research loose and get to the bones of the story and make the story work in quite a poetic way. She, she thought that I had the character from India there who's called Grace and becomes another name later in the novel. She thought she was far too good to be the minor character that we had and so really with Michelle's help I made the two woman characters, the two main characters. William was there but who the, he was off in Seacliff Lunatic Asylum so that has ramifications further down the novel and he is an important part but it was became these two women and it was really Michelle that helped me do that and we actually went overboard after I finished the creative writing course I had I looked at it and I thought this was too much of Grace she's taken over she's taken over my novel so I had to go away and pull her back again journalism you give all the information you've got up front you throw it at the reader a novel you give them a tiny little bit and then you hold a lot back and then down here you give them a tiny little bit more and a tiny little bit more so that you create you know the sense of 
pull and narrative pull and mystery and intrigue that draws your reader through. And I learnt a huge amount from her. And she was particularly good because she is essentially a poet. And it, but you know, a poet and a journalist working together, two completely opposite ways of approaching a piece of writing. So I learnt about when to give and when to hold back. And that was, yeah, that was, I, I can't thank Michelle enough. It was wonderful working with her. And she's still, she's still there and interested. But it's my novel now. <laughs> the hardest part of this novel has been listening to all the different advice I've got and help and working out what is right for me and what, where is my voice. And I think if I come away with anything, it's knowing my voice now, and I will take that into whatever I do next, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. <laughs>